Yeah, so I did not nominate this paper. Jordan will testify that I did not want this paper. Uh, the committee overruled me. Um, written by some hack and published on the Starting Shrink website. Basically a non-systematic literature review and hate piece. <laughs> Uh, triggered by the report of a lawsuit where some personal trainer got cleaned out by a lawyer for failing to warn his client of the dangers of Valsalva and the poor guy popped his cork uh, and had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Plaintiff's counsel used injury data from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, nice, uh, to show that stroke from Valsalva is not uncommon at all and use that data to basically ambush um, the, uh, defendants, uh, uh, the, defendant and the defendant's expert witnesses on the stand. And when I saw that, I just got mad. And that in this article resulted, you all know what the Valsalva is, holding breath against the closed glottis. Everybody does it, even lawyers. When you lift, when you push, when you poop, when you, have, when you give birth, right? Um, certain parts of sex, no matter, there's no avoiding it. And there's a fair amount of literature that shows that it, when you do resistance training, even when you tell subjects not to hold their breath, the bastards won't listen to you. They hold their breath and grunt and they do Valsalva. It's, it's unavoidable under a heavy load. We know that. This is the problem that is supposed to be resulting from this deadly use of the Valsalva. This is a, a CT scan of somebody who has had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. All this, see all this sort of light gray, white stuff here? That should be black on a normal CAT scan. That should be cerebral spinal fluid around the brain stem here and the, uh, in the cistern here around the pituitary gland. This, this should all be black here. This should all be cerebral spinal fluid. It's not, it's blood. This person has popped an aneurysm in the circle of Willis around their brain stem and they bled into the cerebral spinal fluid into the subarachnoid space and had a hemorrhagic stroke. And it looks like kind of a big one. So this person might not do well. Not much midline shift, but hard to tell. This is basically the same part of the brain looking up into the base of the brain. This is the circle of Willis, which is where the posterior cerebral circulation meets the anterior cerebral cerebral circulation, and this is where you have your congenital aneurysms. The red spots are where you have the most of them here, in the circle of Willis, where these circulations join, where the pipes have to be fitted together. That's where you get the aneurysms. That's where you get the, the ballooning out of the vessel to form an aneurysm, which will bleed. And um, if you're going to have a bleed, it's almost always because you know, you have an aneurysm, a congenital aneurysm, or an arterial venous malformation, or a tumor, right? Or you got hit in the head with a baseball bat, right? That, that's how you get a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's not too many other ways to do it. These are the anatomical relationships pertaining to subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is the subarachnoid space beneath the two top layers of the bag that covers the brain right? The dura mater, the tough mother. The arachnoid mater, the, spinal, the spider mother, right? These are the two layers on the outside. Underneath them is the cerebral spinal fluid and the arteries that serve the brain. And then the actual brain tissue in the third layer, the very delicate pia mater here that covers the brain. Blood circulates through the arteries, covering the brain in the subarachnoid space and sends penetrators down to actually perfuse the brain itself. The pressure inside the artery, if the cerebral spinal fluid pressure is normal, which means very low, right, is for all intents and purposes the mean arterial pressure that is perfusing the brain. We're going to call it the cerebral artery pressure, the pressure inside the artery, which is transmitted to an aneurysm. The pressure inside an aneurysm is more or less the cerebral artery pressure. The cerebral spinal fluid pressure, the pressure outside the artery, is usually very low. The transmural pressure, the pressure across the aneurysmal wall promoting rupture is the difference between the cerebral artery pressure, the pressure inside the artery and the aneurysm, and the intracranial pressure or the CSF pressure. That's, does, does that seem intuitively obvious, right? If you increase the pressure inside, the transmural pressure is going to go up. If you increase the pressure outside, the transmural pressure is going to go down. And the, 
and the, trans, the change in transmural pressure is going to be directly related to the risk of rupture. Make sense? Anybody? Okay. So this is, this is the model that we have. This is the brain, which we'll regard as basically a box, right? A closed box. So there's not a lot of room for volume changes here. A small increase in volume will lead to a large increase in pressure. It's a box, right? Here's an artery. It's got a cute little aneurysm hanging off of it here, right? Cute little berry aneurysm. If you lift weights, right, or struggle under a load of some kind, what happens to your arterial pressure inside the artery? Well, it's going to go up, right? And that's going to drive up your transmural pressure as well. So even without valve salving, just doing the effort will cause the pressure inside the artery and the aneurysm to go up and will increase the transmural pressure. What happens if you valve salva to the pressure inside the artery? It goes way the hell up. We know that. It goes way the hell up and thereby increases the transmural pressure favoring rupture. This is why everybody thinks that if you hold your breath while you lift weights, you will blow an O-ring. But there's the other side of the equation. When you valsalva, you increase your thoracoabdominal cavitary pressure, and that pressure is transmitted to the cerebral spinal fluid column and to the intracranial pressure. So it also goes up. And that is the other side of the equation of the transmural pressure. So, it has, so the valsalva in this model has a moderating effect on the transmural pressure and therefore a moderating effect on the risk of rupture. What's that? Are they always approximately equal? They are not equal. So don't get the idea that it equalizes or zeroes out the transmural pressure. It does not, right? It goes up more than most people think it does, but do not get the idea, I am not saying, that the increase in intracranial pressure zeroes out the transmural pressure. It does not. This is borne out by physiological data. I'm not going to belabor this. It's in the article, which is free, right? Nui Adamski used Polish bros or broskis, measured their, basically measured the transmural pressure, right? And found decreased transmural pressures when you valve salvaged compared to when you didn't, which is good if you have an aneurysm, right? Hey, Kowski, what balls on this guy? He took guys with neurosurgical drains in their head, right, in their cerebral ventricles, and then measured their intracranial pressure while they did curls. Like, who was on, who was on that IRB, right? <laughs> Pretty ballsy. Curls without Valsalva had higher transmural pressures than curls with Valsalva. So direct measurement, direct, measurement, <laughs> direct measurement confirms this model. And the clinical data also confirms it, right? Multiple studies saying that you can pop your cork doing anything. You can pop your cork just sitting there. You can pop your cork making love, picking up a bag of groceries, chasing the cat, whatever. And actually, lifting heavy things or doing exercise they're not even in like the top five, right? They're not even in the top five of activities that are performed while somebody blows an aneurysm. And then uh, this guy Sullivan, he took the actual data that the lawyers used to sue this poor bastard, right? And analyzed it, the analysis is in there. And the figure I came up with was, if you did your lifts under Valsalva, uh, three hours for uh, a week, two workouts a week, right? You'd have to work out using their data for 70,000 years to pop your cork if you had an aneurysm. Physiological and clinical data do not support an increased risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage when lifting under Valsalva. That's my position. People with aneurysms do pop. That is the natural history of aneurysms that are large enough. They will pop just on the law of averages. Some of them will pop under the bar. Their lawyers will come and try to take your house. Juries are not selected for their reasoning abilities. And I say that you need a specific, I have a separate Valsalva waiver 
and my clients have to sign it before they train with me. I have a specific Valsalva waiver, and in my opinion, you should too. Brody might have a different point of view on this, but I think you need a specific waiver for Valsalva because you are going to tell your clients to do something that the case law now says you can be sued for. You feeling me? And the fact that it's not correct doesn't change anything. Therapy of sarcopenia, this is the Wakabayashi and Sakuma. They looked at papers between 1989 and 2013, English and Japanese language only. Basic science, animal, and non-clinical studies were not considered. Not a meta-analysis, but a systematic review. Um, they found only 11 therapies with enough data to even be considered in their review for sarcopenia in elderly populations. Eight drugs, muscle in a pill, and whoop, three behavioral modifications. I just screwed up your angle there. Testosterone, sex steroid, enhances muscle protein synthesis. Literature indicates clinically significant decrease, uh, increases in lean body mass and strength in geriatric populations being treated for sarcopenia. Not so great, increased red cell mass and lower so-called good cholesterol. No good evidence, contrary to what you might have heard, for increased cardiovascular or prostate-associated mortality, but they didn't talk about morbidity, except for one study using T-gel. The authors conclude that there is a role for T in the treatment of sarcopenia in elderly men who are refractory to other interventions. Patient screening and selection are important. DHEA is basically a testosterone precursor, dihydroepiandrostine dione, the most abundant circulating uh, steroid hormone. It's a precursor both for the, the, the boy hormones and the girl hormones. Um, and like testosterone, it binds the androgen receptor. It binds the same receptor as testosterone, but it has a very, very low affinity and may actually have an anti-androgen effect at the androgen receptor. Unlike T, the balance of the data does not support much of an effect, and it's not recommended by these authors. Estrogens, the girl hormones, this is estradiol, one of the estrogens, a small effect on strength in women. You've all heard about the health concerns, cardiovascular thrombolems and cancer. Don't ask me about that. Um, the data is so conflicted and messed up, I don't know what's going on with it. The authors conclude that the risk of estrogen outweighed their benefit for sarcopenia, not for other indications. Growth hormone, Jordan's favorite hormone. Um, this is a peptide hormone, not a steroid hormone, secreted by the somatotropic cells of the anterior pituitary gland. Data is mixed on benefit. I think the data is pretty negative on benefit, uh, but this is what the authors say. There's little evidence in support of long-term performance or body composition benefit. The adverse effects are significant, right? You have an acromegaly syndrome and end up looking like Andre the Giant. You can get carpal tunnel, diabetes, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of problems, and man boobs, gynecomastia, man boobs. Stay away from the man boobs. Uh, ghrelin, I'm not going to worry about this too much. The feed me hormone makes you hungry. Um, the data is not good, not recommended. Vitamin D, a number of studies indicate that vitamin D increases muscle strength. I don't think they're very good studies. The pooled data, when you pull that data, it's far less clear. It's basically nowhere. It might be beneficial in people taking statins. And if you have hypovitaminosis D, you need vitamin D. Vitamin D is essential, um, but it's not going to make you huge. Uh, even if you're an old man. ACE inhibitors are interesting. ACE inhibitors is a class of antihypertensive drugs, the angiotensin converting enzyme drugs, right? You should know about ACE inhibitors, but not because they're going to improve performance. The data does not suggest that. And if they improve anybody's performance, they improve endurance athletic performance, not strength athletic performance. There's actually been some doping scandals with, uh, with these kinds of drugs, I think. What you need to know about ACE inhibitors is that they are an excellent class of antihypertensive drugs, and I've now had two situations where I've written to a client's physician saying your client is on a beta blocker or your client is on a calcium channel blocker, and she cannot mount a tachycardia under my bar because you've blocked her AV node. Why don't you put her on a freaking ACE inhibitor? ACE inhibitors have some 
fairly nasty side effects, including angioedema, where you like, where your tongue swells up to the size of Detroit and you like choke on yourself, right? That can happen sometimes. Some patients develop a chronic cough and all antihypertensives have side effects. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't block the AV node of your heart so that you're unable to mount an increased heart rate during high effort. And I want my patient, or my patients, I want my clients to be able to mount a tachycardia under the bar so they don't, you know, pass out, stuff like that. So uh, they're a very good class of antihypertensive drugs. Their suitability for the treatment of sarcopenia as SUPS, not so much. Fish oil, uh, fish oil is good, but it doesn't make you huge. Behavioral interventions, guess what really works? This is the number one intervention for the treatment of sarcopenia in older adults, right? What's number two? Anybody? BCL. Yeah, increase your amino acid intake, right? And overcome that anabolic resistance to amino acid stimulation of mTOR. And number three, smoking. Smoking is positively correlated with sarcopenia not causally, it is associated with sarcopenia. My point is that it's not causally associated with sarcopenia. I think that the, if you look at the Venn diagram for you know, people who don't give a shit about their body and people who smoke and people who are sarcopenic, there's gonna be a lot of overlap there, right? <laughs> so I don't, think it's, I don't think it's a causal association, but still, you shouldn't smoke. Doggy bag, I think you've got it. The best available therapies, resistance training, a diet high in protein, and branched chain amino acids, especially leucine.